Let's stand for our scripture reading from Luke chapter 2. Be familiar words. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified, and understandably so. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, that place, peace to men and women on whom God's favor rests. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our heart as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. One of my favorite Christmas shorts of my lifetime is the Charlie Brown Christmas. And you know how it begins. Got a little bit of ice skating going on, a little bit of snow, got a little bit of singing. Christmas time is here. Happiness and cheer. Yuletide by. See, we could sing the whole thing, couldn't we? Well, it doesn't take very long after this scene that we understand that this is really uh, not a story uh, so much about a a perfect place, but it's a story about brokenness because Charlie Brown is explaining to Linus that he just doesn't get Christmas. No matter how hard he tries, he always ends up feeling depressed. And Linus says, Charlie Brown, of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you are the Charlie Browniest. Uh, this is a guy that is broken. This is a guy that does not get life. And, and, and through the 26 minutes of this Christmas show, he goes from one insulting, painful thing to the next. He's looking in his mailbox. Uh, oh, I get no Christmas cards. He goes to Violet and says, uh, thanks for the Christmas card you sent, Violet. And she says, I didn't send you a Christmas card, Charlie Brown. And he says, oh, can't you tell sarcasm when, when you hear it? He ends up where many people end up at the psychiatrist. There he is. Uh, the doctor is in. And, and l- look, at, look at Lucy's face. And look, at, and look at Charlie Brown's eyes. And, I mean, it's bad. I went to the people that were supposed to help me, and I still found despair. I mean, this guy has lots and lots of pain in his life. So they decide to fix him by making him the director of the play. And they're announcing that he's coming to lead the play. And uh, all the the kids are are complaining. And even his dog is booing. Boo. Boo. Now, imagine you go home and your dog, instead of wagging his or her tail, is booing. Boo. This is not a good thing for Charlie Brown. So he goes out to find a tree, and you know how that goes. He, he picks the scrawny old little tree that's all falling apart. It's the tree that all trees have been measured by. And if, if you've ever been out to get a tree and they were picked over and you brought one home that didn't look very good, what does your wife say? You know, you got the Charlie Brown tree. Uh, all of us know, know what that, that feels like. He, he comes back to the group. He sets up the, the tree on stage. And then we have um, a really catastrophic painful moment where all the kids are gathered around and one by one looking at the tree and looking at him they say boy are you stupid Charlie Brown what kind of a tree is that you were supposed to get a good tree can't you tell a good tree from a poor tree I told you he'd goof it up you can't depend on him to do anything right you're hopeless Charlie Brown completely hopeless you've been dumb before But this time you really did it, and all of his friends are laughing at him. And so he says to Linus, I guess I just don't understand Christmas. Isn't there someone who can tell me what Christmas is about? And then we have this wonderful scene where uh, Linus calls for the camera and the lights, and it all focuses down on him. And he recounts the Word of God, the Scriptures, on TV 
uh, on, on national uh, television. And it's so awesome when they show this because they haven't cut this part out yet. They haven't censored it. And here the whole world gets to hear the Christmas story. And, and when he's done telling of the shepherds and the wise men, he says, and that's what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown. So uh, then the, the next scene is, is, is one I think a lot of people forget. Charlie Brown is headed out. He, he's got a new hope, a new, a new glimmer in his eye, and he's a little bit of joy. And out under the stars, he hears those words again as if God were speaking them to, to him. Uh, let's watch. For behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Linus is right. I won't let all this commercialism ruin my Christmas. I'll take this little tree home and decorate it. And I'll show them it really will work in our play. dog is not going to ruin my Christmas. I've killed it. Oh, everything I touch gets ruined. Everything I touch gets ruined ever feel like that and what's interesting about this scene is he's just had this moment with God he's out under the sky he sees the the stars twinkling it's like the Christmas stars twinkling and speaking to him and he hears the voice of Linus again reading the words of, of peace on earth and then 30 seconds later he can't do anything right and I don't know about you, if, well, I do, because you're like me. Sometimes that's how my life is. I have this great experience, this warm, fuzzy feeling of God's love, and 30 minutes later I'm arguing with someone in my family. Or I, I, I come to church and I have this, this great inspiring moment, and on the way home I catch myself thinking things that I, I shouldn't be, be thinking. And, and it, we human beings are such an interesting mix of, of joy and and brokenness well the kids come out and fix up Charlie Brown's tree and make it all pretty and he shows up and says what's going on and they say all together Merry Christmas Charlie Brown and then in one of my favorite sings they at, at the end they tip their heads back in an impossible state they open their mouths impossibly wide and, and and the whole film is filled with their voices singing hark the herald angels sing and uh, Charlie Brown gets a little bit of Christmas finally after everything. In the biblical story that uh, we read today, the shepherds are the Charlie Browns. They are the ones that no one wanted around. They are the ones that were the low social standing. You notice the scripture says they took an eight-hour shift and went to work in the fields, then came back and got cleaned up. No, they lived in the fields. They lived in the fields, and so when they came to town, they smelled like they lived in the fields. These were people that the rest of the society was not interested in. These were people that were pushed back and, and pushed off. They were not uh, uh, active in the synagogue. Why? Because they were working constantly watching their sheep or someone else's sheep. And another thing that I think is particularly painful, you know if you're doing that job, all of your dreams have been washed away. I'd like to think that everybody wakes up in life with a dream. I'd like to be a this. I'd like to do that. I'd like to rearrange this and have more time for this. And sometimes there are jobs that we end up in where we go, gosh, all of my dreams are gone. I have nothing left to hope for. That's where you're at when you're a shepherd. Nobody woke up in, in the Middle East during those days and dreamed someday that they could be a shepherd. 
It was a job that people took when there was absolutely nothing left. And to these people, to the least of the least of these, God makes an announcement. And it is totally backwards to human thinking. It is, it is upside down to how we human beings normally think. But it is brilliant when you think about what God is trying to do. And it is so doggone comforting to know that to the very least of these, to the Charlie Browns of his day, God brings this message of hope to the losers, to the pathetic ones, to the depraved, the spiritual zeros, those were, who were at the end of their rope, the, the bankrupt, the empty, the lepers, the lame. God brings this message of hope. And you know, in almost every church group, um, not our church, but uh, some churches, uh, uh, there's, there's a group of people that think, you know, uh, being, re- being a good God person means dressing this way and, and getting fixed up just right so we're not like them. And, and, and those folks kind of gather like folks with them, and, and we're the good ones because we're dressed good, right, Darren? We're just, we're, we're okay. So, uh, uh, and, you know, we might accept those other people if they could learn how to dress, right, and if they could get, a, you know, the haircut and, and, and all of that stuff. And if we start thinking this way enough, pretty soon we're full of ourselves and we are the modern-day Pharisees because those aren't the people being full of themselves that God makes announcements to, but God makes the announcements to those who have nothing in this earth to hope for, to the unpopular, to the unbeautiful, to the immoral, to the last ones that were picked on the team. Were you popular in high school? Did you play football? Did you, were you a cheerleader? I was not popular in high school. Uh, I only had about three friends. And someone said, well, you had a small class. Yeah, about 600. Uh, I just, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't popular. And so maybe you shouldn't hang around with me. But you already knew that, right? Uh, it's it's kind of like the Tiger Woods thing. I'd like to have lunch with him, but not this week. You know, let's give him a few weeks to get cool again and, and, and you know, maybe a month and kind of everybody will forget about it because uh, God accepts and loves the beautiful people, right? That's what we, we think. Our brains think that God blesses the good ones, uh, those who work hard and keep their noses clean, those who work er, earn it, that's, that's who, who God uh, blesses. Um, that's how religion functions, it's not how spirituality functions. It's not how Christianity functions. But that's what religion says, that there's some good thing I must do to be worthy of God's blessing. And it's totally the opposite of what God does. Think of the people that Jesus runs with later in his ministry. You know, he's traveling around the hills of Galilee in, in his Jeep. And um, think of the people that are hanging out with him. What's he got? He's got sick people and broken people and prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners. So much so that the religious people of the day branded him. And if you you look at Luke 7, 3, um, do we have this? Maybe. No? No. Well, it's there. Luke 7, 3. John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking wine. Jesus is talking to the folks about John the Baptist and about himself. Jesus came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a a demon. The Son of Man, I come eating and drinking, and you say, look, Jesus is a gluttonous man, a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. God is a friend of the least of these. And if that's what Jesus was doing, I wonder what the Jesus people ought to be doing. And how many people that we know, how much time we spend with people that are broken and on the edge, on the margins of society. How about the story of the, the great banquet where, where the man's going to throw a feast and he invites all the beautiful people. And he says, I want my hall to be filled with all the wonderful people. And uh, guess what? They can't come. 
They begin to make excuses. I have to go to Best Buy and buy a big screen TV. It's Black Friday, and they have a great price down there. Uh, someone else said, uh, I, have, I just bought a cow. Uh, someone else said, I just got married. You know, I'm kind of busy. I have a lot of honeydews. And, and the servant goes back and reports to the master, and the owner of the house says, okay, look, go out into the streets and the alleys of the town. He's not knocking on doors now. There's no apartment. There's no Section 8 housing even. He is going into the streets and alleys to invite people that don't have homes to the banquet. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said what you've ordered has already been done, but there's still room. So the master told his servant, we'll go out of town, go on the outskirts of town to the roads and county lanes, make them come in. My house is going to be full. Who's attending the banquet? All of the people that we think wouldn't be at the banquet. Imagine you uh, driving by the Hilton Garden Inn and you see a lot of, well, people milling around and you go inside and there's a great banquet in the Hilton Garden Inn and all of the tables are set and the food is beautiful and the music is playing, but the people that are there are the bridge people. They're the homeless people. They're the people that have nothing. And you ask someone, how can this be? And they say, we got an anonymous check in the mail that said, this is the party that God throws. Now, I want to say something that's none of my business. Where's Ken? None of my business. Becky? None of my fern? None of my business. Sometimes we go to places like the Hilton Garden Inn, and we buy a chair for 50 bucks and a table for 500 bucks. And we're going to raise money to help a group that helps the poor. And I have no di idea if this is even possible. But maybe someday one of these groups will say, okay, we're going to do this a different way. You buy a chair or you buy a table, but you don't get to come. You still give the money, and we still help the group that helps the poor, but you don't get to come. Instead, this time, we're going to send the buses downtown, and we're going to find the people that we're trying to help. And we're going to pick them up, and we're going to bring them in. And they are going to be in a kind of room that maybe they have never seen their entire life. And they're going to sit down to a meal that maybe they have never eaten their entire life. There are two entrees. There's chicken and a small filet. There's vegetables, there's a twice-baked potato, there's various desserts that they can argue over. And someone is serving them that has a little bow tie. And there's music playing, and the place is warm and festive, and they get to dance. Man, I just, I don't even know if that's possible, but I think, I think... God thinks things like that. You know, at the end of the night, we'd have to take them home, back to the bridge. But I just promise you, to their dying day, those people would remember the time they got to go to the feast that someone threw in honor of the poor. That is none of my business. This is what God is saying in his announcement to the shepherds. You are blessed for no reason of your own. You are blessed simply because I have something to say. I want to say that I love the people who need me. I love the people who have no other hope in this world. I love the people who are ready to put their trust in me. And unto them I give this message of love because I know it's just going to change their lives and they're going to walk out the door completely different, energized sorts of people. There is no test of righteousness for the shepherds. There is no proof they have to show that they are good God followers. The angels simply show up and make an announcement. Peace on earth good will to men on whom my favor rests. I used to think when I read that, okay, who are the people on whom God's favor rests? Well, it must be the good ones. 
Must be the right ones, must be the righteous ones, must be the church folks, the guys that get up and wear purple ties on Sunday morning. Those are the people that, that God must bless. But you know, that's what my brain did with that scripture. That's not what that scripture says. What that scripture says is God sent angels to totally common people and said to them, peace to you. My favor rests on you, you who have nothing you who know you have no, no standing in society. You who know in your own right you have nowhere to go. Unto you I bring this word of peace, and on you my favor rests. The message of God just rushes out to those who are poor in spirit. And what does that mean to everyone on this side of the church? who has some big sin that your brain fights with every week, and you just can't quite get to the other side of it. It makes you feel like the Charlie Browniest of Charlie Browns. It means there is a message of hope and goodwill to you because upon you, God rests his favor. And for all of, all of, all of you over on this side of the church, maybe you're like someone I know who's parents inadvertently got this thing going in your head that wakes you up every four days and says, you're terrible. Every four days, for some reason, you wake up little d depressed and, and you don't know why, and it just keeps you broken and knowing you have no one to depend on but, but God. The word is this, peace and goodwill to you upon you, my favor rests. These are the people to which God brings this wonderful and awesome message. No wonder they call it good news. So, I have an idea. Uh, this week, go to the weakest person that you know, the person that no one talks to in your office, and take them to lunch. Go to the person that everyone's mad at, and take them to lunch. Go to the most annoying person at your workplace. I hope no one comes to see me this week and wants to take me to lunch. <laughs> and if they're really annoying, just say, I bought you a Panera gift card. Merry Christmas. <laughs> right? uh, go break the cycle of uh, separation. Anybody here in junior or senior high? Raise your hand. Junior, senior, high. One, two, three, four, five, six, a few. Okay. Okay. I know how the lunchroom works. Okay? There's always a table where people sit that no one else wants to sit with. And everybody else groups with their friends. You know what Jesus would do? Man, I'm telling you, he's making a beeline for that table. And I'm not going to ask you to do it every day, but maybe one time. Take your lunch and go sit with those people that no one else wants to sit with. And I'm just telling you, young person, you will be like Jesus that day because that's, that's what he does. Here's another thought. Sometimes we can't fix everything, but we can make an announcement. You know, um, after the shepherds saw the baby, they went and they told their stories of joy, but then what did they do? Well, God fixed them up with new houses and cars, and they got to be important people in town, right? No. God didn't fix their stuff. They were still shepherds. They still had to deal with life. And, and if you're like me, I suffer sometimes with the inequities of this life, and I, and, I, and I wish I could win 20 lotteries so I could fix the world for every person that doesn't have the things that we take for granted. We can't. But we can make an announcement we can go to those people and speak to them. We can stop them when they're walking down the hall with their head down. Hey, how are you doing? Man, I like you. Thank you for working here. We can send them an email. Thank you for doing that thing that you did. You know, we can't fix everything that's broken in the world, but if you just take a moment of your time, you can make an announcement of good news. Just a little bit of your time to tell them, thank you, 
God bless you. And what are you telling them? God loves the people that no one else loves. I don't tell them that exactly, but they'll, they'll know. They'll know there's something different about you, something different about your church, because I'm telling you, that's the people that Jesus is looking for. Imagine the announcement and the angels and all of that here now in 2009. Would that happen here at Woods Chapel Church? No. No. Would it happen in Lee Summit? No. Happened down under one of the bridges where someone woke up this morning with an empty bottle of wine, pulling up cardboard boxes on themselves, and an angel would be there to say, I've got some good news. Peace on earth to men and women on whom God's favor rests. And, and you may think no one else's favor rests on you, but God's favor rests on you. Well, some of you who are here today, um, you're doing okay. That's good. Probably all you need to hear is just a reminder that are all around you are people that we let go by that, that we need to, to stop and, and care about. But others of you are here today, and you walked in this door, and you feel like Charlie Brown. Someone is always moving the football. Someone's always laughing. Your own dog won't come when you call. You know, we laugh at that stuff, but there is a heartache that we humans experience sometimes that just breaks us down. And, and I, I just want you to know, when you come to the point, and all of us can come to this point, where we know there is no house that will do it for us, no car that will do it for us, no nothing that the world says that will do it for us, when we know that, that we can trust in none of those things, then... We become eligible for the angel who shows up to say to you, to you, to you, peace, good will, God's favor rests on you. And so we light a candle of hope. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your table now, we are so thankful for the amazing gift that you gave to us in Jesus Christ. This gift of love and forgiveness we've done nothing to earn or deserve, but we receive it freely and we thank you for it. Free us from the religion that tells us we have to be good enough. Teach us of this love that is unbelievable this grace that is amazing. And as we come to receive the bread and cup today, quicken your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that we might have a sacred moment with you at your table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.